welcome to the Retro Blood. Welcome back, everybody, to the Retro Blood. As we start a brand new month here in the month of May 2024, talking all about slumber parties, talking graduations, talking slashers, talking teenagers. Talking knives, drills, guitars, weed, beer, you name it. Because we are doing the Retro Blood Slumber Party Month here. And up first, we're starting this off hot with teenage girls getting together for a slumber party while the parents are away. They're going to be doing some drinking some weed smoking, some pizza eating, and trying to figure out who was the baseball star of the day. Uh, While there is a crazy maniac driller guy who escaped from the somewhere, and he's coming to drill all these girls down because he loves them, because the Retro Blood is talking all about the Slumber Party Massacre. The first one, from 1982. Welcome everybody, this is James Klein, and unfortunately, for this uh, week, there is no uh, no Jay Austin on this particular week, he actually is feeling a little ill right now, um, so this is actually the uh, the Retro Blood's uh, first ever solo show, can you believe that, out of like a hundred and something, where are we at now, like almost like one, if you count the lights out, we're probably like almost like at 150 episodes right now, and this is the first ever solo one, so um, best wishes out there to um, Jay Allison, he's uh, feeling a little sick right now, so uh, you know, for this month, I might be uh, rocking it solo, alright, with you guys, if you guys like hearing my voice, you're going to hear a lot of it for this month, because we're going to talk all about these uh, these uh, slasher movies, man, they're... Uh, they're pretty, uh, pretty wild, huh? So, like, this one is a very interesting movie. All right, like, it's like, you know, w- w- we had the ex- the success for Halloween one. We've had the success from Friday the Thirteenth, uh, Part One, and I think we, I think Final Exam is around this time as, as well too. So, you know, the slasher genre is like full force right now. And it's very interesting with this one. It was supposed to be like a like a spoof of it. So like we're already trying to like spoof it. You know what I mean? Because you know, to me, like, okay, I'm pretty sure there was like slasher movies. You know what I mean? Like before Halloween. But I think you know, after Halloween, which we talked about this a little before when we were doing our Halloween episode, check them out in the archives. That uh that they were uh you know, they, 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 you know, we had slashers before, but they weren't as popular as they got with, you know, when, when Michael Myers came on the screen. And then we had, you know, Jason's, you know, Jason and then Jason's mom on the screen. You know, we started seeing a little bit more of the, uh, the, the slashers. You know, we, we saw that a little bit with, you know, Final Exam, you know, some other ones as well, too, uh, around this uh, time period. So this is, uh, this one's pretty fun. Like this one, actually, it's, it's really interesting. That the of all movies with the title and everything, like the Slumber Party Massacre, you know what I mean? Like it sounds so like goofy, you know. It just sounds like it's gonna be like a comedy in a way. Just, just you know, when it, when you think of that movie, come on, what what comes to you know mind? Obviously a slasher, and this is just like comedy. But it's very interesting that this movie what gained such like a cult following that they actually it's like a tri- like, this is like a whole like universe almost in a way. Like, we had, this movie spanned four movies, okay? Well, actually, three of them. Uh, we're, Summer Party Massacre 2 and then Summer Party Massacre 3, which came out in the 90s. Uh, but then they had, they they did do a remake of it. Or I think it came out last year, 2023. They remade the first one, which I haven't seen before. And then, you know, we also did those on this podcast before, too. Sorority House Massacre came from this and the Cheerleader Massacre. So it, it kind of, like, spanned its own, like, little universe in its own way which is pretty cool so uh but yeah like we'll, we'll, we'll you know we'll talk about it. it's gonna be pretty fun like uh you know this isn't my first solo show i've ever done uh it's been a while so i might be a little rusty out there guys but um it's been a little while like 
like when I was doing my old podcast, just to sidetrack because I do that all the time. So when I did my own podcast, uh, the faces of fear, you know, every once in a while, I couldn't get my uh, my co-host at the time, Bloodbeard on there, or, you know, I had many co, I had some other special guests on there. Uh, but I remember the the first one I ever did solo was the uh, on that particular ep- uh, uh, podcast. I did They Live, and I did it all like by myself and everything. And uh, it, it's different, like you know, you don't have somebody to bounce back stuff off of. Um, but go check it out, everybody. I did that. That's on our. That's on the Facebook uh, makeshift kings on there. Uh, check that YouTube page out. You can find like old, like very old podcast stuff I did in there, music videos and stuff. I'm trying to give it some more love, but listen, guys. I'm busy, you know what I mean. I'm I'm kind of like the um, uh, I'm kind of like the uh, the gym teacher on this movie. You know what I mean? Like uh, I'm just uh, I'm, I'm busy uh, uh, training everybody out there. You know how how to do their business and stuff. I guess. <laughs> but uh, I appreciate you guys joining us. Um, like I said, best wishes to Allison. Um, you know I'll keep you guys updated. You know about him and stuff, but you know, well, you know, basically, you know, he just uh, he's doing he's doing his thing right now, um, out there. So uh, you know, best wishes for him. Hope he uh, has a speed of recovery. Uh, but let's get into some of this stuff. So you know, you know, we usually do like a history segment uh, he- here on the Retro Blood, but uh, I think I'm going to save that um, uh, for this month. I'm not going to really do too much of that because you know, with the history, so I really like to have like Allison's opinion on it. You know, mainly because like you know he is like the uh, the messiah, okay, of of 80s metal, all right, like, me, like, I'm, like, I know some stuff about it, but, I, you know, he's more, he, he knows, like, more of the backstory than I do, um, you know, we'll, I'll research it here and there and stuff, um, but, uh, I, but I, I, I like going back and forth with him, and I kind of, like, picking his brain when it comes to the 80s metal, um, I guess, you know, maybe I'm, like, more of a, uh, actually, I don't actually, Maybe more of like a 2000s metal, I might more and a little more history about. Um, but 80s metal is always very fascinating. I love talking about it on the show, but I'm going to say that with him. And same thing with the 80s wrestling too. Uh, especially for this week, it was kind of weird. Like there was like this uh, King Kong Bundy stuff. And then like there was like this Kiss album I wanted to talk about. But we'll save it for like, because we're going to be doing movies around this uh, month and time frame as well too. But yeah, the Slumber Party Massacre. This movie actually premiered in Los Angeles <clears throat> around September tenth, nineteen eighty-two. So we're about two years into the eighties, all right. And like I was saying at the beginning, like slasher movies are pretty much like the hit thing when it comes to horror movies around this time, you know, because of the the success of Halloween, Friday, Friday the Thirteenth. Um, you know, like I said, uh, we have some other ones out there too. I can't think of all of them off the top of my head. Uh, but this, the slasher genre is, is hot right now. So this one is actually pretty interesting. So this is actually an all female written and directed, uh, uh, production over here, which, you know, you don't, you can see a lot of that nowadays. You know what I mean? In the uh, 2024s. But, you know, back then, especially for horror films, you don't really see a lot of like, female you know directors or or editors or you know producers you know maybe producers you you would see some of that but you know when it comes to the right especially the writing because boy like let's let's be honest you know what i mean like if these slasher movies are not like male dominant written like i don't know what to tell you but this one was is very interesting how it was written and it was directed by uh, uh two females so this one was directed by Amy Holden Jones, okay. And what's interesting about her is, like, she wanted to do some directing. She wanted to break into Hollywood to do some directing because she already she's already she was already doing some editing at the time, and she actually turned down the role to edit E.T. of all movies to do Slumber Party Massacre. And I I remember, uh, so basically with this, um, with this movie, I actually went out and bought this movie. Yes, I, I didn't stream it, everybody. Now you can stream it if y'all want to, uh, before I do my whole review. Uh, you can find it on Tubi for free. You gotta watch a couple commercials and stuff. But you know, me and Allison, before we have talked about, we like the physical media. I like physical media. 
And I remember seeing this movie, which I I, I think I talked about this uh, last week. But I found this movie at a local, uh, I, I guess it's a kind of a horror shop. You know, they sell a bunch of, it's kind of like a, a movie trading company style. But they have mainly horror movies where you can go sell your shit and uh, the, you can go buy some stuff over there too. So I, I saw this one over there and I was like, oh, okay, that's cool. They had double, the you know, on 4K. So I was like, fuck, I'll just buy it because I love slashers. So they had a, a commentary track with her on there. And that, then she brought that up. She's all like, you know, she really wanted to break into to, to Hollywood to do some directing and stuff. And that's why she got, you know, this part. And then she had to turn down E.T. And I was just thinking about that. I was like, wow. Like, and I was just thinking in my head, you know, that's pretty cool. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, obviously E.T. is a, uh, you know, well-known Steven Spielberg movie. Uh, you know, it was, uh, you know, obviously one of the most famous, like, PG, I guess, movies for its time. You know, you know, when you're kids, you know, watching this, it was very different in Slumber Party Massacre. I mean, just too different on the complete scales. But it's pretty cool, like, the, you know, this, uh, uh, this Miss Jones over here, you know, directing it, making us stuff, you know, kind of do very low budget, you know, B st- style horror film. But it grew to be a, a like a franchise, which is pretty cool. You know what I mean? Like she was part of this uh, the startup that to, that actually grew. Like it's you know it's kind of like what well, basically I'm trying to say here. It's kind of cool that she was started something like a started like a franchise, even though it might be an underground style franchise, but it's still a franchise and just being an editor on a very famous movie. You know what I mean? So I guess you could look at it a couple different ways, but I think it's kind of cool. That you have more, you know, you had the more hand of, of creating a fun franchise for fans out there that span many movie, many movies, even remakes today, than you did just being some editor on a very famous movie. You know what I mean? So, but uh, let's see what else. So we, this was actually written by uh, uh, Rita Mae Brown. Okay, and some of the stuff of of how the the. Uh, the screenplay was written was the original title for the Slumber Party Massacre was entitled Sleepless Nights. What do you think? Sleepless Nights over here, everybody. Sounds like a, uh, I don't know, it sounds, it sounds like more, 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 like to me, the Sleepless Nights sounds more like one of those B, uh, uh, porno movies. You know what I'm talking about? You know, like the Red Shoes Diary and shit. You know, like they used to have, like the soft core. That's what I'm thinking about. Sleepless nights. That'd have been, uh, that'd have been interesting. So it was actually uh, wrote has a parody. All right, like you know, like I was saying, it's very interesting. Like we're already in 1982. We're already, we're already trying to get parodies of a uh, of, of a slasher, but apparently, you know, Brown's script was uh, reproduced, and it was made to be a, a more of a serious slasher film, and it was against her wishes. All right. But, you know, that's why, like, the film is like, it's like half, it's like, it's like half serious, but there is some comedy stuff to it, which I'm cool with. Like, you know, it's kind of like the, um, it's kind of like the Evil Dead thing, you know, where a movie is, it, 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 it's supposed to be serious, but it's so serious that it comes off as comedy. I wouldn't say this one reaches that level. Like, I could see they were trying to do a little bit more, you know, what do you call it, movie, you know, tropes and stuff, like, you know, normal slasher stuff, they're trying to do that on here, but I thought it did work pretty well of, like, keeping it serious and, like, having some, like, you know, goofy stuff at the same time, um, I thought that was pretty good, but they're, that, that's pretty much they were going for, at first, she was trying to go for a straight, just, like, kind of like a slasher parody, but then they kind of switched it around to make it a little bit more serious, so, so Amy Holden Jones, the editor uh, th- that I was talking about, she wanted to direct and ask Francis Dole for, for advice. Dole gave Jones a number of scripts. Jones chose the script that would become Slumber Party Massacre. And then going by the title of Don't Open the Door. So wow. So now we so okay, so so Rita, okay, had a script called uh, Sleepless Nights. But then when it got to the uh, the film, uh, another title it had was Don't Open the Door. 
Okay. And uh, then she decided the film's first uh th and so then she decided to film the first three scenes. All right. Her husband, cinematographer Michael Chapman, acquired equipment and film and hired actors from the University of California, Los Angeles. And they shot the scenes at their house over a weekend for one thousand dollars. Wow. Can you imagine that? Like this film. You know, I would say for horror fans, like you know, especially slasher horror fans, I think a lot of them know the Slumber Party Massacre. You know, I it's not like this movie is not like well known, but it's very interesting that you know it's such a low budget um, that this movie has actually gained a lot of you know big cult following and uh, you know obviously more money than that would be. Um, so she showed the results to Roger Corman, who agreed to finance the film. So basically what they did was they like, like like I was saying they they filmed three scenes from this s script Don't Open the Door which was also Sleepless Nights. So the script was Sleepless Nights, the movie was going to be called Don't Open the Door and they filmed three scenes over a weekend in California and then Roger Corman he agreed to finance the film and then during all this stuff that this is when Jones had to turn down the job editing Steven Spielberg's ET as a result. So that's how it all kind of worked out. The filming began. The, fil the filming for the full movie began in the summer of 1981, and it was filmed, shot on location in Los Angeles, California, mainly in Venice. So pretty interesting that we got here. And of course, you know, going from just filming those three scenes with a thousand dollars, the budget on this movie was about two hundred and twenty thousand dollars. But at the box office, it made three point six million, which is crazy. And that just shows you the power of the slashers at this time as well, too. You know, it was very high demand. Uh, I, I, You know, the only time I could think that the slashers were very high on demand again was probably after Scream in the 90s. I mean, I can't think of another time. I mean, it kind of right now. You know, if you count Terrifier, but I don't know if I count Terrifier has like a like a like a like a straight slasher. You know, I mean, it has slasher elements in it, but I don't know if I would count it as a, uh, a as a complete slasher style film. Uh, Thanksgiving was obviously, um, but you know, like, but yeah, like the only time I could think because you know, Scream, we had Scream, then we had uh, 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 I know what you did last summer. Uh, you know, the the Hatchet series came by. We had um, uh, Wrong Turn. You know what I mean? Like, you know, those are, you know, not straight slashes, but there's more of that style. Slasher style films were coming around around that time. Uh, but yeah, it was very interesting. Like, you know, it's just very, it's very interesting around this era. Like, like 1982 and stuff and, and, and the beginning of the 90s is very, very interesting movies. Every time we talk about them, I just think like the way they're shot... And the way they're, you know, produced, like it's very, it it just seems like very organic. Like a lot of their films in in the early '90s that me and Allison talk about, they just seem like very very organic. Like there's not there's a lot of like, it's not like you have like a lot of rules. You know what I mean? Like I feel like nowadays, like in movies and shit, like we gotta have CGI here, we gotta have you know ethic placement here. It's just like you know back in the day, brother, just to just get a crew that's cool. And go out there and see what happens. You know what I mean? Some good shit. So, um, you know, some of the cast on here, they didn't really have, like, too many people that actually went on to do a lot of stuff. Um, this is actually distributed by New World Pictures, which I believe, like, we've been talking, like, I think, like, almost all of last month when we did It Came From The Sky, like, half those movies were, were uh, produced by New World Pictures. Uh, so, you know, big, big horror movie company at this time, and they're just picking up everything. Um, yeah, the, you know, some of the cast, I think the only one on here was the uh, our girl who played Linda. All right. Uh, she was on here, and she was, uh, before she got into to acting and everything, she was actually a undergraduate degree in biology. All right. And then she did some modeling, and that's how she got to uh, uh, work on this film. But this was actually her first major role, was this one. And we talked about that before. You know, a lot of 
actors and stuff like their first role and first roles in Hollywood and it could be on both sides you know like how we as we found out with Miss Jones you know a lot of times horror movie will break you into the industry right away because you know horror movies are very they're very popular you know what I mean and it doesn't take a whole lot of money to produce to produce certain horror movies. I can say all horror movies, but it's going to, you know, there's not a whole lot of money that will, you know, produce certain horror movies. So a lot of times, you know, they'll hire people that are not like, you know, expensive. You know, they're not just going to go hire, uh, you know, Steven Spielberg to go, you know, yeah, we'll have him do certain movies that are in high end, but some low, he's not going to say Steven Spielberg presents the, uh, the, the teenage massacre or something. You know what I mean? So like you know we're gonna we're gonna find these new people and they, that's the way they can break in which is I always think is so cool and we've seen that many times especially during the eighties where you see a lot of um, a lot of famous actors and their first movies are actually horror movies uh, but it looks like she also went to uh, she she actually was like a little bit of a like a scream queen herself this uh, this Britney Stevens um, her, this is her first film the Summer Party Massacre. And then she went on to uh, to appear in numerous horror films, including Sorority Babes and the Slime Ball Orama. That'd be a fun one. Night Sister, Nightmare Sisters, my bad. Grandma's House and Mommy. Oh, okay. So she's also uh, co-written several films, including the comedy horror feature Teenage Exorcist, 1991. So we'll probably be doing some of those movies for later months on the Retro Blood, that sorority babes and little slime ball arama seems pretty fun when it comes to there. Um, but yeah, I mean, like this is a this is a very interesting movie too because you know I can't recall like even during this particular time of there being a a horror movie where you just see the killer right off the bat. Like he just like he's just a a sick dude, you know what I mean? And I kind of like the aspects of that where you just see the killer, you know his name, and he's just out there, you know, doing his thing. Where there's no mystery, there's no mask on him, there's no hidden backstory where you don't know who he's from or anything that we got to uncover later on in the movie. It's just a sick guy who's already been killing people and he escaped and he's killing some more people. Because, you know, a lot of times, even in real life, we would see that, you know, you know, like, you know, obviously, you know, some of them were maybe not like, you know, like the Zodiac obviously was a mystery. All right. Uh, but, you know, I'm thinking like maybe the, the Sam, the son of Sam, you know, obviously we knew, knew what kind of what he looked like when he was doing the killings. Um, so I think they were going for like that aspect of it. They're, they, I don't think they were trying to create like a... Uh, like a monster character, like a, like a, you know, like a, like a iconic franchise killer killer or something. They, I think they were trying to go for more of like a realistic, like killer in this, uh, which, you know, in this movie, obviously, you know, when you're watching it, you can see a lot of the, um, the, the message behind, uh, uh, most of it, you know, obviously with the killer, with the drill, the drill is supposed to rec- re- uh, represent, like, you know, the male, ma- masculine, you know, peace to him. You know, conquering the women that he's, that he's stronger than. Um, I liked it where the uh, the actor who played the killer, uh, the killer Ross Thorne, okay, was played by uh, Michael Valera. And he, you know, if, if on, on, the, on the documentary I watched... Uh, part of the part of the 4K, you know, he actually uh, uh, st- he wanted to bring more of like a realistic, you know, side to the actual killer, where you know he he would study some of these like serial killers, you know, that were out there at at that particular time, and he would find out like you know what's the uh, what's the motivation behind why he's doing this, and when when he was doing his research, he found out that a lot of these serial killers when they were on tape or you know they they confess it was all out of love. Like they they loved the dominance over their victims. They loved uh, you know torturing the victims. They they felt like they were giving the the victims like a service of them, you know, killing them. And he wanted to bring that to the character. That's why at the that, that's why towards the end where he was all like the character. She's like you know why 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 are you doing this? He's like well I love you. 
and it is very powerful right there and i like how he brought that like that sick twisted mind to the actual character i thought that was very creative for the time because you know they could have just made the guy mute and just ran over there and just you know because we've seen that's gonna happen in the 80s where they'll just they'll just make movies where there's just a random killer just like chopping people up and that's it you know there's no like it just it, it, they, they think all these horror films they just want to see gore and shit so i liked it where this one actually brought like real life elements to the film to make the the ross character you know obviously a little bit more realistic not just making him some sort of slasher dude and he just goes off so that was pretty cool to that. Um, you know, and also, you know, showing, uh, you know, females, you know, fighting back. You know, obviously during this time, the uh, the final girl well, was starting to, to roll up, you know, a lot. You know, when it comes to, obviously we had that Halloween and Friday the 13th. And mostly every slashers, you know, at least has the final girl going on to that. Uh, this one was, you know, didn't have one survivor. Actually had a couple on there. Um, but yeah, it's, it's very interesting style movie, so... You know, I just like I I can see why this one does have a like a you know co following because it's 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 a slasher film obviously you know what I mean it's like a very traditional style slasher film but it, it's also very creative too because you know when you watch so many slashers that have like the killer hidden behind the camera you don't see his face until the end he's a shocker or you have like a a killer that's all masked up and everything and he just you know like a killer you know like a Michael Myers type or a Jason behind the, you know, the, the mask or whatever, you know, or like, you know, even Friday the 13th part one where it was like the mom, but you don't get re- revealed to the end. Like this guy, he's just out in the open the whole time. Like it's very different. So I actually like that element. I thought that was pretty creative uh, for this particular time. But everybody, I say, let's get into the full review of the first ever Slumber Party Massacre. The basketball team is planning a party. A slumber party. The party begins at 8 o'clock. Love it too. You think I'm getting better? (laughs) But be on the lookout for an uninvited guest. Please, please. When the pizza arrives, things really start jumping. Some people may have to leave early. But others will hang around and hang around. You're underage. Negative. You're not going to eat that dead guy's pizza. I feel better already. Really, I do. But for those who stay, there'll be plenty of surprises. And non-stop action. for sure no one's getting any sleep the night of the slumber party massacre close your eyes for a second and sleep forever all right so we're here so basically you know we start off like you would see like almost any movie you know we got this town this girl's waking up to a screaming radio all right and if there's something this movie definitely likes to do that is show female titties. All right, so if you all are a fan of titties, this is the movie for you, brother, because they're everywhere. You can even, you know, if I say titties on here, if you want to take a shot, go ahead. You know, we're all here to have fun. So we got this girl, and uh, she is, uh, you know, getting dressed and everything. And this is when we meet one of our main char- characters. This is when we meet our, our girl, Trish. All right. And she's getting there. And basically, what, what's going on with her... So, a, a couple of things I noticed right away. Okay, so basically with her... <laughs> so, her parents are going away. You know, going on a trip and everything. And basically, she gets the house by herself. So, she's going to have a slumber party with her friends from the basketball team. But the first thing I noticed right away, she's like... She tells her friend, Oh, I could say by myself I'm 18. 
and listen. Listen, she might have been 18 at the time, but she did not look 18. She at least looked 22. Okay? Like, this happens, like, all the time in these films. Like, like I mean, maybe she just looked older for her age. I didn't see 18. I at least saw, like, maybe 22. That's all I'm saying. So, we've seen that before in horror films. But they'll fake the age on there. So, while all this is happening, we do hear a radio broadcast saying the, the killer uh, Ross is on the loose. And then... We meet these two dudes. Alright. And no shit. The fucking dark haired guy. Which I believe his name was um, David. On here. This fucking guy looked exactly like a young Michael Keaton. Alright. Listen guys. Why, don't tell me it's not. Like watch the fucking film. This guy comes on here, and I was like, what? Is this my... There was no way. I was thinking in my head, like, this is 1982, and they filmed in 1981. The Batman didn't come out until 1989. I was like, you know what? Can he, can he age that much? And You know, was it like eight years? Or maybe, you know, they probably filmed that in 88, so seven years? I was like, you know what? You know, growth spurs can happen. And unfortunately, it's not. It's not Michael Keaton on there. <laughs> Bro, if it was, I would have freaked out. Like, I would have been like, what is going... He went from Slumber Party Massacre to the Batman? I would have been like, what the hell? But this guy could have been his son or his brother. I mean, he looked exactly like the motherfucker. I could not believe it. Okay? And then he had his other friend, which I just named Beavis. All right? Like, he... So, I basically, I called him... I actually called him uh, uh, B, uh, B and B. Batman and Beavis on here. That's what I called them throughout the whole movies. Um, so, uh, but yeah, it's like this is very interesting. I believe the guy, the other guy's name was Jeff, or Jeff might have been the the Michael Keaton one. Um, I got him, I got it confused because like literally on my notes, all I wrote was Batman and I wrote Beavis. Okay, so that's how I uh, that's how I did the two. Okay, so they're they're in the school and everything, and they see uh they see this girl. All right, and she is working on the uh, the cable line to the school. Okay, so whilst they're right doing that, I start start started talking to her because our boy Jeff, all right, he uh, or or the or uh, Batman Michael Keaton over here, he wants to uh, see what she's all about, and he was all saying like, you know, she's cute and everything, and asked if she needed to help. She didn't need any help. And then uh, she's going to her van. They they kind of say bye. She's all happy that these two teenage boys were flirting with her. And then she gets grabbed in her van. And so, like, the 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 actress that was playing this cable girl, like, I know I'm like a like a wrestling dude on here. You know what I mean? Can't help it. It's like my main things are wrestling, metal, and 80s horror movies. That's why we started this podcast. So this girl, like, right when I saw her face, I was like, man, this girl looked exactly like Summer Rae. So all my wrestling fans out there that's listening to the show that still watch wrestling today, this girl looked exactly... She looked exactly like Candice LeRae. That's what I meant to say, not Summer Rae. Candice Candice, uh, LeRae. Uh, So basically, she gets killed right away in the van. So there there she goes. And nobody sees her at all. It all just happens. So now we got a lot of these girls playing basketball like I was saying before. They're all on the basketball team. Uh, and they noticed that the new girl, Valerie, she is really good. She's like a transfer girl. She's over there. And they noticed that she's really good at the, the, the women's basketball. So now, like every great 80s horror movie, all the girls are in the shower now. Tits out everywhere, brother. Better be drinking. I see you over there. Better be drinking. So, I like... <laughs> I believe it was on... Um, I believe it was on... Uh, 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 Trish's... The, 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 the lingering shot with the butt. I mean, it was on her butt for like at least a good like five minutes. No, no, maybe, 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 maybe two minutes. I'll give it two minutes on her butt. Uh, so they're talking everything. Basically, they're just talking about the sports. They're talking about 
how Valerie's good, and they're and then they're trying to figure out if they uh, if Trish and and, and uh, some of the other girls should they invite Valerie to the slumber party. All right, so you know Trish does, but like some of the other girls are not because they're jealous of her being so good at playing basketball. Oh, okay. So you know Trish just says it like, hey, you know, she goes up to her like, hey, I'm having a slumber party. Would you like to come? And you can tell Valerie at first she agrees, but then she overhears the girls next door. Uh, I believe the girl, uh, uh, Diana, talking shit about her, saying, "Ah, she's just so, you know, she's too goody-goody. She plays basketball too well. I don't know if I can have her over. And, like, literally, like, the next, like, lock her over, (laughs) she can, like, hear it. It's just, like, going away there. And and then um, Trish notices that she was listening, and she's like, oh, shit, she ain't going to come to the party now. All right? And then now... They cut. This is kind of a cool shot where they they see Valerie leaving the basketball court and she's passing by the dumpster and we see that that cable girl is in the 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 trash can. They just left the body open in the fucking trash can in the middle of the day. Yeah, because that's what you do in the eighties, brother. So now, so now one of the girls named Linda forgot her book. Okay. At the locker, so she tells the uh, the coach lady that she needs to go back in there. So she gets back in there, and now the driller killer is now here, and he's uh, attacking her, and he actually drills her in the shoulder. All right, so they had like this big chase scene around. She's hiding in the uh, one of the rooms, and she's actually trying to. This is pretty clever. She was trying to cover up because she's bleeding through the shoulder, right? She got away from the from from Ross, the driller killer. I just called him the, the, the drill. Is that cool, everybody? The drill? Like, do I have to say Ross the whole time? Can I just say the drill? That's basically what he was. The driller guy. So she's hiding there, and she had to, like, put the little scarf on her uh, on her uh, shoulder, right? And it was really crazy because, like, it was bleeding too much. And, you know, he couldn't find her or anything. And then he eventually goes near the door where the blood's spilling. And she's trying to, like, get up the blood before it goes to the door. But it actually does to the door. So he eventually sees it, and he breaks in. All right, and it gets her. So now we cut to a scene where Diane, she is out there and looks like she's being chased by somebody, but it's actually her boyfriend who looks extremely nerdy. I mean, fuck. All right, and now we see that the teacher, the the coach lady, she has gone home too. And <laughs> so we get like these like little pop scares, you know, they, they like to do those. So if the first one we got was the boyfriend c- coming up near Diane having her drop her book. And then the next one was going to have the uh, the coach lady come home and there's somebody drilling through her door. All right? So the drilling through the door, okay, it was a girl named Pam and she was like basically the, 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 the coach lady's helper. All right? And then the girl, she was also asking, hey, is there the uh, the cable guy uh, was around too? And she says, well, she, she hasn't seen the cable guy. Which I thought that was actually going to play more of a, a role in this particular movie, but it didn't really do that. Uh, so Trish, now she's getting, um, she like plays the piano, okay? And now Trish is also, she got scared by the neighbor, all right? Uh, the neighbor the neighbor guy was um, there earlier that I didn't mention. He, he was based, the when the parents left, the neighbor, uh, he was just tasked to, uh, you know, look over her and stuff. And Trish is like, ah, oh, shit, like I don't want him around. But, you know, he's just kind of there. Like, the neighbor's kind of there being a little nosy and stuff. And, you know, the, the neighbor just saying, like, hey, you know, you know, I'll just wait here and stuff and, like, until the uh, uh, until your friends get here. So the uh, the coach lady was trying to find her cat, and she finally gets scared by her cat, too, Muffin. So we're doing a lot of these, like, scares. You know, like, these little jump scares throughout the little mid part of the movie. I like, this, I like my notes here. Beavis and Batman, all right, they want to scare the girls, okay? And they're worried, though, because the girls can beat the shit out of them. And they're talking about somebody who they fucked before. I was like, what? So I, I didn't really understand. They, they were saying that they want to go and scare the girls at the slumber party. And they're worried that some of the girls are going to beat them up. But they said that they actually had sex with one of these girls before too. And the girl's name is Chin. I was like, I, I didn't. Maybe it was me. I didn't get it. All right. So now we have some of the girls arriving. 
uh, the driller killer is in the bush. Just saw him in this thing. It's just like, like, how do you just hide your whole body? It's very interesting in this bush because this bush is like right next to the front door. It looked like, and he just hid it himself in there. It's very interesting. All right, so now they're they're talking about like the weird neighbor they had next door. He goes away. And uh, the, the 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 girls they basically get there right, and they have like weed and beer and everything. They're like, oh yeah, we're gonna get smoked and get all fucked up. And then like, Trisha's trying to like tell them like, yo yo yo, cool it, cool it. And then the the the, the neighbor comes by, is like, all right, you gotta be okay and everything. Like he knows they were talking about weed and smoking and everything, and he's basically saying, okay, I won't tell your parents about the weed smoking if you don't tell your parents that I scared you in here. And they agreed, and he left. And now they're all gonna be start smoking some weed, and of course. The girls talk about what else? Dicks and boys, brother. That's the way. You, that's what you do at summer parties. You smoke some weed. You talk about some dicks. You know what I mean? Come on, now. What did you think they were all about? So we hear some. We hear some noises. All right, going off, and they hear basically the noise was a coffee cup exploding. All right. So now Diana showed up. All right. And now we can see that Valerie and her sister, they hear, they, they're, they're talking to each other. And the sister is basically saying, like, you know, why weren't you invited to this party and everything? She's like, ah, oh, why? Well, I didn't want to go. It's, it's not that I wasn't invited. I just didn't want to go. Uh, and the sister's like, whatever, you didn't get invited. <laughs> so they hear, they hear the dog uh, messing up the trash. And the big thing is, I guess there's a dog in the neighborhood. And every time they hear it, Valerie goes out there and has to fix the trash for the dog. This wandering dog out there that messes with the trash. So she goes outside and then she sees, um, she sees like uh, the, the playground thing swinging. All right. And then she hurries back on side. So we have, now we have Beavis and Batman. They're watching the girls undress. More titties. Drink it up, boy. Drink it up, everybody. Actually, I'm going to take a little swig. Here's out to the titties in hair, horror movies, everybody. Take a little swig. <sighs> yeah, there we go. So they're watching them all and stuff. And, you know, the girls are talking some more of the drama. All right. Uh, Batman's... <laughs> Batman. Jeff. My boy Batman on here. He says he likes he likes that cami girl. He needs to pay more, more attention to her. All right. They're all loving it and stuff. Uh, so now, this is an interesting scene. So, like, Valerie's sister. Huh, I mean, I don't know. She might have been, like, 16, maybe, I guess. Maybe 17. I have no idea. But, you know, they, it's very... Uh, I, I did like the interaction between Valerie and the sister because it's very natural. Like, like, like I was saying before, like, you know, these 80s, especially the early 80s, 80s movies... Like the dialogue and the uh, the way that the characters act, I thought they're look like, they're just a little bit more realistic than what you would kind of see like nowadays or you know, even like in the nine you know later on the nineties and stuff too. Like I just feel like the the characters are written a little, little bit more just just real. Like you know they're they're talking about you know the the sister she's getting to that age where she's starting to get interested in boys, all right, and she's also trying to explore more of the sexuality where she's reading all these like. Uh, playgirls you know what I mean and Valerie knows that and you know they're just going back and forth I'm gonna tell mom I'm gonna tell mom like you know they're they're joking around with each other uh they even made a joke saying like you know I guess the dad died and she's like well I wish they didn't have you before the dad died like you know they're very dark style of humor but it's very it's very natural how you would talk to your sibling like that in ways you know what I mean like we're not they're all not PG out here talking, you know, when you talk to your siblings. So So she's doing all that. Uh Trish, she is getting uh some food ready. And they, they're they're gonna order a pizza for everybody. Alright? They're getting the pizza going on at the house. And I'll definitely come up right later. Uh Diane's out there now, she's grinding firewood, and she gets scared by the neighbor. Who the neighbor, his hobby is killing snails. Is that like a thing? Is that... I, I, I have no idea. <laughs> is it me? Maybe I'm... 
I have no idea. Like I, 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 I seen snails before, but I didn't know there was actually like a, a thing where you go out there and, and you kill snails and you count them down like this guy, because he's on like number fifty four. I mean, is that easy to do all day? Just fucking go out there and kill snails? Like, what do they ever do to you? You know what I mean? Very interesting. Maybe, maybe uh, tweet me at, at Retro Blood. Is, is, is snail killing a thing? I got. I don't. I have no idea. Okay. So. He kills him and, and, and like kind of scares a little bit of Diane, and she goes back inside, and then the guy he's killing his fifty four snail, and then the drill guy kills him, so he gets drilled. He got drilled, brother. That's another drinking game. Somebody got drilled on here. All right, and the uh, the bad team they heard it, but they're like they're like now nah. we want to stay we want to stare at these titties. Brother, we don't we don't got time for the drillers on there. So Diana, she brings in the wood, and then now the girls are talking about their horoscope. All right. Uh Trish is uh she's uh she's kind of looking outside, you know, because you still hear some noises out there. They thought they hear some noises too. And she uh, Trish asks, like, hey, did you close the garage? And Diana can't can't remember if she uh, uh closed the garage. And then they look out and they see the doll, some doll. That was the doll that actually Trish threw away. At the beginning of the film, I didn't mention. My bad. Hey, man, solo. I can't remember everything. And it, it came all fucked up and everything. And they got all scared, so they go and close the garage. Uh, and when they got in there, they see that the uh, team bad, Batman and Beavis, they're in there. And they start fighting them a little bit. And they're basically saying, like, hey, you know, what are you, what are you guys doing here? That, you know, and... And then we, we also cut back and we can see that Valerie and, you know, this Valerie and her sister are just doing their thing. She's reading the Playgirl still. Okay. So they go in. So now the the girls are there and they're they're with Bag, so they know they're there now. And they thought, they, they just thought like, you know, all the noises and the little noises that they heard were all from the team Bad on there. Uh, Tris, now the lights go out, of course. 80s horror movies, man. And Trish thinks it's the fuse that was blown. And then they start sound like I guess the uh, the creepy sound. You know when the lights go on, they're trying to scare somebody. It's the Twilight Zone um, sound you would do. Does that make sense? Like you know how like you know the lights go out and you're trying to scare somebody. You know in the 80s, brother, you use the Twilight Zone sound. All right. So they go to the garage. And they had to go through the pool to get to the garage too. Um, they think the the fuse is not blown, but it's missing a part. All right, and of course, uh, I think I jumped the gun. But this is when Jeff and 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 uh, Team Bad shows up. All right, and now Valerie, now she hears uh, another. They, she hears the noises from the trash can again, and she's like, "Oh fuck, the dog is out there again." So she goes to the trash can. And then Valerie gets scared by the, uh, uh, and she gets scared by her sister Courtney outside. And they yeah, apologize. So now, now, um, Courtney, the sister, Valerie's sister, and her, they're out there. We get, uh, uh, our boy, Diana's boyfriend from earlier. All right. Alan. He showed up, right? And he is basically just looking for sex. All right. He's all like, listen, how about you come with me? My parents won't be home until midnight or something. All right. We can go have a good old time. All right. And I'll bring you back over to the slumber party. And she's like, well, I don't know about that. She's like, come on, just do it. All right. So she she has him come in and wait in the garage for some reason. Like, why couldn't he just wait outside for her? Like, I didn't get that part. So, like, she he drives the car in the garage. And I guess... Like, I guess, I guess her plan was, okay, we're going to... So the plan is, we're going to drive in the garage. And we start making out and stuff. Alright, so, you know, he's going for second base and everything. Got a little titty action going on there. She denies him. Alright, and she's like, he's like, come on, why don't we go back to my place from here? Just tell her, tell tell uh, uh, Trish. You know what I mean? I'll bring you back and everything. And then eventually she agrees. So I guess she didn't want to... Um, Give it up in the car, brother. She wanted to give it up at the house. 
So she go. Diane goes, talks to Trish and all the girls in there, saying like, "Hey, I need to go out for a little bit and go go grab some beer, and I'll be back." And they all know that's code word for getting some sex. All right. So they all they're all like making fun of her a little bit about it. And Jeff is in there, confused, looking like a young Michael Keaton, like I was saying. So during this though, the driller killer kills Alan while this is happening. So. Diane goes back in there. She's like, okay, we can go now. She's all happy. She's about to give him a kiss. And then she tries to give him a kiss and his head just falls off. And then she starts to scream and honk the horn. But at the same time, they're making shakes so they can't hear her. All right. So she's doing all that. And then eventually the driller killer attacks her. She gets out of the uh, car. And this is when we get the famous scene of her screaming with the drill kind of like near his, uh, looking like a dick basically in front of him. And then Diana gets drilled. She gets drilled, brother. So, pretty wild scene. So, during all this stuff, uh, two of the girls at the house, they got they want to figure out who was the star of this baseball game. All right? And they're basically, they're saying that the whole night, they cannot figure out who the star of this particular baseball team was. So, uh, Courtney hears, hears the noise outside. All right? And... At this time, the Valerie girl, she doesn't really care. She's like, okay, uh, I, don't, I don't hear anything now, so everything should just be fine. So it was just a quick noise. Probably just the girls just making some random noise. So so now the girls are talking to the uh, to, to, to our boy Batman and Beavis about the doll, and they have no idea what they were talking about with the doll. That's like, that's like the trick that they didn't play. And then they hear a noise. Oh, the pizza guy is here now. So the pizza guy shows up. All right. And during this stuff, the, one of the girls calls the teacher because they really couldn't figure out who was this star on the uh, on the uh, the baseball team that they're trying to figure out who who this guy was. All right, so they call the teacher about it. And during this stuff, the, the pizza guy is there. No shit. Like, let's see. We, okay, if we're not counting the guys there, there was probably let's say we had we had uh, if I can remember all their names, we had. Uh, Trish, we had Diane, and we had Cammy was one of them, and then we had the uh, the other girl, which I don't remember her name. So about four girls, right? So what do you think? Like one pizza, maybe two, two pizzas, maybe. This guy was all like, it would be six dollars. I could not believe my fucking six dollars, bro, for one, maybe two pizzas. You know what I mean? Like how do you? you, you Maybe if I went to the 7-Eleven, I could find that shit nowadays. But the fucking... You know what I mean? I was just like, damn, $6. And, then, and, and, and they were trying to like round, round up cash to try to find it too, which is funny. I just could not believe it. Six fucking dollars for this fucking pizza. You know, now I were at one pizza. That shit's like $15. And that's not even including the tip. All right. So the pizza guy, you know, he says like, you know... He's hearing everything, but it wasn't his voice. So they open up the door and they notice the pizza guy's eyes are out. And he's dead. And they all start screaming. The teacher overhears the, 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 them screaming on the phone as well. And then Trish is she's trying to call. I like this. She goes to the, uh, to the phone. She's like, I'm going to call anyone. I was like, bitch, you better call the police. You're not going to be just calling anyone. Who are you talking about anyone? So while she's on the phone... They just cut the cord. All right. And the coach is trying to call back, but she can't. And then now the coach is trying to call um, uh, uh, Valerie. All right. And Valerie just like, well, I haven't heard nothing over there. Everything's been fine and nice and stuff. I'm not sure. They got to just be playing around. So she blows it off again of them. So now Courtney, she wants to go over. She, Courtney wants to go over there and see what's going on. She wants to physically go there. All right. And now, now we're back in the house, and Jeff wants. He, he, they, they all lock up the house now because they, you know, they notice there's a killer out there. Um, and the, now Jeff and Beavis, okay, they are going to figure out. They lock up both doors, and they're basically talking to each other. Like, listen, one of us has to make it out there, and we could probably go to Valerie's house because she has a working phone and she's over there. She's only like the next door neighbor, so. One of us, you know, the the guy can't catch both of us. So one of us is going to make it. That's what they were talking, telling each other about. And I like the one where, like, Trish gives, like, Jeff a knife. And he's all like, man, I don't know what to do with this thing. 
I was like, you got to be fucking kidding me, bro. What are you? He's like, I wish I took them, uh, I wish I took those uh, Boy Scout lessons. Bro, it's a fucking knife. All right, come on now. <laughs> Just fucking use it. You'll be all right. So, yeah, he's, uh, he's, a, he's a lover, not a fighter, guys. Come on now. Our young Michael Keaton. So, they're both planning on escaping. Uh, one of them's going to go through the garage. One goes to the, uh, to the front door. Um, they both get the little goodbye kisses. Our boy Vivas gets two. So, you know, they were happy about that. So now they're running out there. Jeff, he's going through the uh, going through the garage. He sees the car in there. He's trying to see Diana, but he's, he's like going near the car, and then Diana's corpse like falls on him, like you know, falls from the ceiling of rocks. So the driller killer Ross had the whole time to like put her up there and have her swing at the perfect moment. You know, kind of like a um, it's kind of like a, 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 a Jason's mom from from Friday Thirteenth uh, uh, Part One. You know what I mean? Where she killed all these dead bodies and this fra- fragile old lady can throw human dead corpses up trees and stuff. No problem. So our boy Ross can do the same thing. So he sees her hanging from the garage. He freaks out. And then he gets drilled on the shoulder. All right. And now we can see that Valerie, she's watching a movie. And Beavis, he tries to go to the door and like get her, her attention and stuff. And I felt like this seemed like seriously took like it seemed like it took like th- like eight minutes, all right? It's like this whole thing in begging, and he's like trying to look back on his shoulder and everything to see the killer. And uh, we we hear Courtney, she's upstairs, she's talking about French kissing some dude, all right? And then we see Beavis, he finally the driller killer comes to him, they fight, uh, they fight over the knife, and then eventually Beavis gets knifed. So the driller killer not only uses a drill, but he knows how to use a knife as well, too. Unlike Jeff. Speaking of Jeff, he is here, and he is on the staircase, basically bleeding out from his shoulder. Because remember, he was at the garage, and he got drilled. And then we cut it, and now when we cut back, he's like kind of like he escaped from the... He like basically, uh, all the way from the garage to the... He's trying to get inside the house. And during all this stuff... This scene actually was pretty good. The um, the girl that I... I don't think I, t- I said her name. But I believe her name is... So I believe the girl's name is Jackie. Alright. I actually thought she was a, a looker. So Jackie's on there. And <laughs> she's like... They're, they're basically right there, Jackie. And then um, uh, Trish and the rest of the girls... And she just, like, gets part of the pizza and eats one because she was hungry. And I'm like, what the hell are you eating this dead man's pizza? So I thought that part was pretty pretty clever. And then they hear noises throughout the house. And eventually, like I was saying, it's Jeff at the door. And he's he basically, he, he's pretty drilled pretty bad. And he can't, and barely could talk. And the girls don't want to open the door because they don't know if it's like the pizza guy. You know, where it's just like a trap for them. And then during this stuff, the coach... She is, she's worried, so she's on her way. All right. So now we have Valerie. She is now looking for Courtney. All right. And she sees Courtney go next door. Like she's like looking at the window. She actually sees Courtney go ne- next door. And he start, she starts to follow her sister. And then the Courtney sees the sis. And now she's trying to hide from her sister. So we're doing like some hide and seek thing on her here. So Valerie tries to knock on the door. No answer. Of course, you know, the girls are in the back, so they don't really hear her. All right, and during this stuff, you know, the uh, um, Jeff, Michael Keaton, he's dead. He gets drilled again, so he's gone out of there. And then the driller killer after that, he's actually in the bushes, so he knows that Courtney and Valerie are outside as well, too. So, so they they hear the door, okay? They, they, they hear, so Jackie... All right, I believe it was Jackie, Cammy, and, and Trish. They're upstairs right now because they're trying to get a, you know they they saw dead Jeff and they ran all the way up to the uh, to, to to Trish's room and locked themselves in. But then they hear a knock and they think the knock is from from Valerie. So Jackie wants to go let her in and open the door and the other girls are telling her not to. So she goes all the way down the stairs to open the door and then she gets drilled in the throat. Am I allowed to say that over the air? Drilled in the throat? Okay. So there she goes. 
And then the girls go upstairs and they lock herself in the room. And then we we get some uh, some interesting dialogue coming here too, which is very interesting. So so Val looks around and she uh, she, she's looking around. So Val didn't hear anything. So she's she's looking around outside and she finds Courtney and uh, you know Courtney was just playing dead. And they think nothing happens, so they can't find anything. So they start looking around some more. So Valerie now is going inside. All right. She's looking around. So Val thinks like she's like, you know, Val is just trying to look around. Valerie's trying to look around on the house. So now, you know, Trish and the Cami girl, they're thinking like, you know, what's going on here? Like, you know, should we go to, should we should go to Valerie's house? And Trish is like, well, I don't know. Like, how come, you know, we, we heard Trish, you know, we heard Valerie at the door, but then there's the killer and stuff. Maybe they're working together. Maybe they're friends. And then the girl's like, well, that's a very, uh, uh, um, what's she say? That was a very uh, uh, crazy reaction to not being <laughs> invited to the party. All right. And then while they're all talking stuff, the driller killer is behind them. All right. And they eventually see him. All right, and then they uh, they 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 try to escape. All right, but then Cammy she gets stabbed um, with a knife in the belly. Uh, he, he they so Trish she does like knock down the killer, but she doesn't even finish the job. And they try to escape, and that's when Cammy gets killed. And now the uh, the uh, the drill guy is now looking for Trish, but she hid. Uh, she actually did something clever. She actually hid in the closet. Behind a, like a jacket bag, so that was pretty clever. All right, so now Valerie is, is she saw this is when she sees Courtney lying down. She's faking it. Uh, she's going to go, and, she, and then basically Valerie's like, "Okay, I'm gonna go lock up the house because there's nobody here. We don't find anybody. We haven't heard anybody. They're just like a dead party." So Courtney, she wants to, uh, she wants to start, you know. <laughs> Courtney's like, you know, she wants to grow up fast. She wants to drink a little bit. All right. And she's basically begging for the drink. She's basically saying, like, you know, this party was a was a dud. And she keeps she keeps trying to go into the refrigerator. And every time we go into the refrigerator, we could see the girl, uh, Cammy. If we could see her, like, I guess he had time to stuff her in the refrigerator. And every time we do that, we see her like coming up and coming down, coming up like three times, all right, to do the gag. And eventually, Courtney tries to go get a beer for the last time. That's when they see the dead Cammy girl. And they all start freaking out. This is when the clock starts to go off at the exact time they start going up the stairs. They were going to go up the stairs, but the drill man's upstairs. All right. And they, uh, this is when they split up. So Courtney, she hides under the couch. And Valerie, she goes into the staircase. And then the drill guy, he, take, she, he takes the pizza guy they killed earlier. And he throws him down the stairs. And Valerie sees the whole thing. And... Now, this is like a random scene, which I'm not really sure why he did this. But, like, the driller guy, Ross, hides himself underneath the sheet. All right? And then we just so happen to get the coach shows up. All right? And, you know, Trish doesn't hear things. She comes out of the bag. And the coach comes inside. She's looking for everybody, says everybody's name. She eventually... She was wearing a, a, a top that said Speedo, too. Is that like something I'm supposed to... Not, is that like a brand? Speedo? Okay. So, and then she's basically... like She was trying to answer these girls' questions. It was actually number six. The guy whose name was Thomas. Oh, okay. So we finally got that mystery. So now, um, <laughs> Valerie's trying to find a weapon, right? And she finds a... Like a like a chainsaw, a plug in, a plug in saw basically. Not maybe not a chainsaw, but a plug in saw. And she's gonna use that, and she tries to run with it, and it unplugs, and she falls down. Comedy guys, all right, come on now. So, <laughs> I like my notes here. So the, uh, the 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 teacher, she she opens up the 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 blanket to see who's underneath it. And then when he does it, she solves it's the driller killer. All right. And then the driller killer and her start fighting. And when my notes put the drill and speedo start fighting up the stairs or fighting near the, fighting near the, the fireplace. All right. And she's fighting with one of those fireplace weapons. 
whatever Allison calls them. I just call them fireplace weapons because they're there for they're there for the baby faces to use a weapon to fight against the killer's weapon. That's pretty much why they're there. And then while they're fighting, Courtney trips. Remember, she's under the couch. She she trips the driller killer. And this is when we get um, we get some attacking on him. Like she, this uh, this teacher does like the weakest shots I've ever seen in a horror movie to try to get this guy to get stunned. And he kind of pushes her back. Uh, I, I, Valerie finds Jason's knife. Okay. Like the big ass machete. All right. And this is when we have Trish. She's coming there. She finally stabs the driller killer. But it doesn't really do anything. She's not really good at stabbing. So the driller killer gets back up and he kills the he kills the coach. He like drills her in the stomach while the gut's falling out and everything. And then now he's um, he has his drill and he's about to drill on Trish. This is when Trish was asking him, like, you know, why are you doing all this stuff? And he's basically just saying, like, well, it's because I, you're, you're all pretty. All of you are very pretty. He says, I love you. He says, it takes a lot of love for a person to do this. You know you want it. You love it. Like I said, very creepy dialogue, you know what I mean? Like, very, like... You can hear, like, you know, one of the realistic serial killers saying all that. I thought that was very clever that they added that part in. So now Valerie shows up. All right, she breaks a lamp randomly. And she chases the drill guy to the pool area. So we have this standoff at the pool area. And he's about to drill her. But then she cuts his drill bit off. Like, cutting part of his manhood off. Because remember, the driller was, the drill is supposed to be his weapon of love. His, uh, his masculine man weapon of love. She cut it all off. And then he's like, you know, he still thinks he has the upper hand. And he doesn't think she's going to do anything to him. And then she, she and then uh, Valerie, she cuts his hand right off. And this guy's screaming like fucking all around the place. And he's like, I'm going to kill you. And then she slashes him in the belly. And then he falls in the pool. And then, of course, uh, Valerie drops down. She drops the knife as well, too. Courtney goes up to Valerie. The, the weapon has been dropped. The, the Jason's machete has been dropped. All right. Uh, then the drill guy comes out of the pool for one final scream. He, like, jumps on... He tries to go grab him, and he knocks off Courtney. And then Trish tries, tries to come in, fails with the knife, like, super bad. He just slaps her right away. All right. And then, like... I... This is a weird... So, he, like, jumps at Valerie. Or, like, leaps. And then he leaps. And then Valerie grabs her machete. And he just leaps right onto the machete. The driller killer does. So, death by machete. All right. And it was just weird. Because it's, like, one of those, like... Well, that slow... It's, like, that slow motion jump scenes they do in movies. It's just so random. Like, the distance doesn't seem right. Like, he could have just walked over to this fucking Valerie. But no, he had to do an old 80s jump. So he can jump on the machete and die. So he jumps on the machete and die. They all cry. And then we can hear the uh, ambulance come. And that's it. And that takes us out of uh, Slumber Party Massacre 1. Very fun movie, I thought. You know what I mean? It had everything that you're looking for in the 80s movies. He had some titties. You know what I mean? You had some teenage drama. You know what I mean? You had some jump scares. You had some pretty good death scenes. Pretty crazy shocker death scenes on there. You know, a killer with some crazy motives. You know, some final girls at the end. You know what I mean? I thought it was pretty good. You know, it's not gonna... I wouldn't say this one was gonna be like the most, you know, breaking the bank on anything new, but I thought it was pretty clever, like I was saying earlier, that they actually had a killer who's more like lifelike I guess in a way so very very interesting so but everybody thank you for joining me on this solo edition of the retro blood podcast so for the like I said for the rest of the month I'll probably be going solo um out here too you know Allison he's still gonna be um you know working on his health this whole month uh, best wishes to him 
Uh, hopefully you'll be back with us next month here on the Retro Bud. But for this month, I'll probably be going solo. And we will be doing the... Uh, uh, next week, we'll be doing the Slumber Party Massacre 2. All right. Which I, I heard this one's like a, more like a comedy. I mean, maybe this is what the uh, the original director intended. So we'll see. We'll see how this goes. And then we're gonna uh, we're gonna do the last slumber party. Yes, there. This movie was so successful that we have a copy of it in the '80s, brother of all things, the last slumber party. And then we're gonna round it out with a very fun graduation day. Leanna Quigley. I always like talking about her and all her movies. She's great. So that's gonna be pretty fun. But yeah. It's going to be a, a fun May month over here, talking all these slasher, 1980 slashers. Like I said, everybody, thank you for joining uh, me I'm on, a, on a, a rare solo episode. Pretty crazy, you know. I, I, we got through it. I got through it. Like I said, we're going to be doing that for the rest of this month, too. So join us on here. Check out the Facebook. Check out the YouTube. Check out the Instagram. Check it all out here on the Retro Blood. And everybody, I will see you here back next week talking Slumber Party Massacre 2. Good night, guys. I will see you here next week.